Blessed be everyone. Hello and welcome to another episode of Black Magic Talk. Today we have the wonderful Toby Chappelle. Is that how you say it? Chapel. Chapel. Okay. Toby Chapel. And he's a linguine. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I can't even say it. <laughs> um, so uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Toby? Tell us how you got on your path and what you do. And uh, we'll go from there. So uh, my, my history is a bit long and tangled, which I think all good histories ought to be. Um, so just a little bit about myself in the present, and then we'll kind of move, move back into the past a bit. Um, so in the present, uh, I am an author. Um, I, I write about uh, linguistics and semiotics and the left-hand path and runes and magic and H.P. Lovecraft. Um, I have one book uh, published already on inner traditions called Infernal Geometry and the Left-Hand Path. Um, it's about five years old at this point, believe it or not. Um, and I have another book, which will be coming out in April of next year, called The Languages of Magic. Um, and that one that's upcoming focuses much more specifically on uh, what has become known as the semiotic theory of magic. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go. Um, As far as how I started going down th this path, it is lots of places where I never expected I would be where I'm at. Um, if you look back <laughs> into the past, um, which I which is a good thing. I think we should always exceed our expectations, whatever limits we placed on us when we were uh, younger or or older. Um, so I, I grew up in Georgia. I've lived in Georgia for um, other than three years when I lived in New York City. I've lived in Georgia basically my entire life. Um, so it's a lot of my sort of uh, background and, and culture, you know, families with deep roots in the South, um, pioneer families in some of the middle Georgia counties and things like that. Um, so my, my family's been here a long, long time. Um, and, you know, so I feel a very special connection to, to where I'm at. And that being said, the, the small town where I grew up um, was kind of, you know, just a general kind of place in middle Georgia. There wasn't anything especially interesting about it. Um, other than being the birthplace of Doc Holliday, oddly enough. Um, but, you know, my, my upbringing was you know, rather conventional, I think, in terms of religion and, and magic and that sort of thing, where it was basically not talked, <laughs> your religion was sort of assumed and magic was not talked about um, because that was, <laughs> the, 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 them's the devil's words. Um, so, you know, around age 10 or 11 or so, I discovered, uh, you know, heavy metal, uh, discovered uh, discovered Satanism in, in a weird and roundabout way, actually. Um, I had, had sort of become exposed to some of the actual ideas of uh, Anton LaVey and, and others. And so when that sort of became in the 80s, this big thing, this big cultural uh, question, in the, especially in the southern U.S., um, I knew a bit more about it than most, um, and so didn't fall for some of the the BS that was that was being said around it. And that being said, you know, when you're 12 years old, you know, you secretly think that all your favorite bands are in league with the devil and um, and all this, and then you find out later that for most of them it's just a game. But you know, there's a couple of bands that kind of make you wonder, hey, what what if? Um, and so that was kind of my my background. I was always very curious, always very um, sort of like science oriented, but also very language oriented. Um, I was really um, I, I kind of struggled kind of which sort of direction to go in thinking you kind of had to pick one or the other For better or worse. I ended up picking the more, uh, the, the, the computer science route. Um, and that's where I've spent the last, you know, 30 or so years of, of my career doing uh, primarily server oriented, uh, computer stuff. Um, but I've always had like a deep interest in language. I, I did four, four years of Latin, um, uh, which, uh, which is, very hard to, to come by in a public school in the middle of Georgia. As it turned out, the Latin teacher there um, had a PhD um, in, in Latin, uh, was a, was a well-respected Latin scholar, um, wanted to teach, you know, to reach younger people because, you know, they're more amenable to being molded. And really, you know, he, he kind of fostered my love of language, um, you know, kind of taught me, uh, taught me the magic of language, if you will. Um, and that's always been a very big influence on me. Um, and, and in fact, my, my next book will be dedicated to, to him among um, other people um, for that for that seminal influence. And so that that's always been kind of part of my background. So fast forward a bit when I went off to college and, of course, going from 
you know, small town to big city, you know, you're exposed to a lot of things, including, um, you know, other approaches to religion as well. And so I, I started kind of trying to find the others um, and find other people that had, uh, you know, similarly non-conventional views to mine. Um, spent a lot of time with, um, there was a very active, uh, this was at Georgia Tech in, in Atlanta, spent a lot of time with a very active um, pagan community there. It was very eclectic all over the map. You had everything from Thelemites to uh, to Satanists to uh, Church of All Worlds types to to Wiccans to to indefined, I'm just a pagan, that, that's all I need to say about myself kind of type. So really uh, got exposed to a wide range of there. And that's, that's actually a fantastic environment for uh, finding out what you really think, what you really believe in terms of how you see those ideas reflected off of other people. Um, you know, there are a lot of discussions around what do you think about this? How do you think this works? Do you believe in this? Um, that sort of stuff. And it really did kind of um, help me kind of hone in a little bit on um, the directions that seemed viable to me um, and which ones turned out to be actually ones that I might look forward um, to as a, you know, as a longer term path. Um, and then it was it was a few years after that in the late 1990s that, that I uh, first learned about um, well not first but but unknowing to myself at the time relearned about uh, the temple of set um, thought it was interesting wasn't quite ready to to join something that um, I couldn't meet someone that was part of first um, so I spent a couple of years with the local uh, OTO body. Um, because the, there was someone part that I knew, there were a couple people there that I did respect, a couple people, you know, that I didn't really care for much of what they ended up doing, but it was a very valuable experience to me. Uh, again, both in the deepening horizons, but also in just figuring out, finding people I can talk to about, about these things sort of, sort of bouncing around in my head about how the world works and how we can affect ourselves and ourselves within the world, uh, which is really what magic is at its core. Um, then ended up joining the temple of set in 2000 after finding that okay this lines up with as best i can tell with the things i'm looking for and you know 24 years later that that still is is, is the case where i find that that's sort of my default orientation in a, in a lot of ways even though ironically i'm not very much um um not very deeply into egyptian um practices as, as part of my work uh, one of the conceptions misconceptions people sometimes have about the temple is that it is a neo-egyptian organization and it's not um that just the there's reasons why is the temple of said and not and not something else uh, but those have to do with the antiquity of the ideas that um ancient egypt worked with and the way that those really got to the core of the human condition and the core of what ex what is the psyche what is the psyche in relation to the universe um what is the psyche in relation to other gods um, etc um one of the things that I became um, more aware of uh, as part of the temple was uh, were two things which have been very vital to my my later path. Uh, well, multiple things, but I'll, I'll talk about two of them. Um, two of them being the runes and um, the works of H.P. Lovecraft. Um, going back, but there was no way I was getting an H.P. Lovecraft book in uh, Griffin, Georgia in the 1980s. Um, but so later I, you know, both because I had people that I could talk to about these things, but also because I had resources, people that knew about these things that I could really um, talk about them with and dig deeply with, I became uh, much more interested and, and began to work in more active ways with with both Lovecraft and with, with the runes. Um, that, of course, sort of culminates at, in uh, my book, Infernal Geometry, uh, which is essentially about the intersection of those ideas. Um, the H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, the idea of uh, semiotics and magic, and the, the idea of um, you know, Pythagorean number mysticism, and you know how that sort of became part of some certain rituals within the early Church of Satan that were written by Michael Aquino, who was the founder of the Temple of Set, and then later were more developed as a as a, a system of magic, if you will, within the temple. Um, as far as the the semiotics and language part, um, so that that interest in language was still there, still is there, still is an obsession. Um, you see one bookshelf behind me. This is the bookshelf. The top two shelves are nothing but um, study and authors. In fact, the top shelf is basically all Stephen Flowers because he won't stop writing, um, thankfully. Um, and then there's a shelf off to the side that's even about twice as big as that, which does nothing but linguistics and semiotics. Um, 
so to, to say that it's it's a deep interest of mine would be sort of understated i think um but um Interestingly, runes was the gateway to that. The reason the runes were the gateway to that was because of Stephen Flowers, and in um, the, you know who's Stephen Flowers' PhD. Uh, his PhD was in Germanic languages um, from the University of Texas at Austin um, in 1984. Um, um, curiously, the same year that his uh, first book Futhark came out, so it's a very sort of transformative year for him. Um, so we're at 40 years since that uh, now, and um, the second chapter of that book where he's trying to lay out what a theory of magic would look like. So you can actually get um, measure against that to decide, is this particular use of runes magic or is it not? One of the problems with runology, especially in the academic world, is that um, there's a great deal of skepticism about magical uses of runes. Uh, they prefer generally to look at them as a system of writing and little else and are interested in them for what they teach us about the early Germanic languages. Um, that being said, there's a great deal of evidence um, that there were some magical connotations to the runes um, in their original conception in the way that they were used. And so as part of this uh, dissertation that Flowers is writing, where he's trying to um, talk about runes and magic in a scientific way, he, he spent some time looking at then current theories about magic from the anthropology world. And one of the things that pops up there is this idea of, um, of semiotics and magic. And um, semiotics is the study of signs. A sign is anything that refers to or resembles or evokes something else other than itself. This can mean, you know, like a, a picture, but it can also mean a word. It can mean a smell, a scent. It can mean anything that, um, that can be interpreted to learn something new about the world as a result of the encounter with the sign. And he uh, pulls on some previous work. Um, he did not coin the term semiotic theory of magic. It actually comes from a Norwegian anthropologist named Ronald Brambo from the 1960s, um, who wrote about semiotic theory of magic, of looking at a way, ways that you can see magic in terms of how you work with signs and symbols. So if you think about when you're doing a magical ritual of some type, you may ring a bell, you may light a fire of some kind, you may have certain words you say. All these are, are symbolic signs. And what a symbolic sign is, is a sign that has a meaning that has been settled by convention. Um, if you hear a sound like the sound of a bell, the, that's determined by what a bell sounds like. Um, it has no meaning of itself. But when you say, oh, I'm ringing the bell to cleanse the air, or I'm ringing the bell to um, to set off this ritual chamber from the everyday world, you're bringing symbolic associations to that. You're adding meaning to the sign that's not inherently part of the act of ringing a bell. The act of ringing a bell is physics, pure and simple. The act of you realizing that sound you just heard as a bell is physics combined with the way that you perceive sound within your within your ears and within your brain. Uh, what a bell means to you and what it may mean that's different from me, that's different from um, each of you, that's a symbolic association. Symbolic associations change. They can mo they can be modified. They can be over overloaded with new meaning. They can, um, they can be used in different contexts with different significance. Um, and even from that short description, you can probably start to see where this goes at, in terms of magic. You know, magic is very much about working with signs and symbols in ways that you inject meaning into the phenomenon that you want to bring about. You you have a conversation, if you will, with what is yet to be manifest, and you're talking to it in symbols that both you and it can understand. If I start speaking, you know, Swahili to you, which I don't speak Swahili, um, you know, or you or you speak it to me, um, you know, if we don't, if the other person doesn't understand it, then you haven't communicated. All you've said is, is that this person speaking something you don't, you don't comprehend. But we're both speaking in English now. Your listeners are listening to this in English. And so the extent to which um, everyone involved with that, that linguistic act understands English, that will, that will affect how well they understand what I'm saying and what, what the conversation that we have. Um, and so this idea of a conversation you have with what you're trying to bring into being is a very potent one. And so it, it requires that you do have symbols and signs that you have in common, that there's a, there's a sort of a shared language about them. Um, but you're also just like, if I start, tr I'm going back to our bell example, if I start describing a bell in a new way to you, then um, 
I'm adding new meaning to that. We are creating new meaning and understanding together as as we both kind of get on the same page of what this means in this particular instance. Um, and again, that's part of what you're doing with magic is you're you're taking a known sign and you're shifting it slightly so that it takes on some additional meaning and you're putting that out into um, the realm of signs um, to cause an effect, whether that effect is meant to be on yourself or meant to be on another person or meant to be on something new that you're trying to bring in, into being. Um, the mechanism is, uh, is very similar in, in that sense. Um, so to make sort of a long story short there, um, so that taking that influence from Flowers, uh, Flowers' dissertation uh, there, that, that chapter was hugely influential on me and it, that's, you know, has set me off on the path that I'm on now, specifically of looking at magic as a semiotic process and developing it more fully into a general, more general semiotic theory of magic. Um, he wrote specifically about the runes. There's another scholar um, um, who's uh, in the Rune Guild um, who um, wrote a book about very hard rack and text. It was his dissertation around semiotics and the runes. It's very dense work, but that's what it has to be for what it, the audience it was written for. Um, I, I see this in a broader sense, um, and, and they, they do as well. They were just writing about the runes, um, but I'm writing about this in a broader sense and, and not writing a dissertation with it. I'm writing um, a book for, um, for a, uh, a wider audience as well to try to explain these often very kind of dense and hard to um, understand ideas in ways that are more relatable so that um, there's basically new, new potential for magic in the world as a result of it. So I've been talking for a bit, so I'll kind of... No, that, that's perfectly fine because we want you to talk. We have like, uh, you know, 40 some minutes. Um, but you had talked about, you know, uh, magic and science. Can you elaborate on that? Because I find that fascinating that we can at least look at uh, magic from a scientific perspective. Because, mm -hmm. I, I mean, because, you know, up until, I mean not recent history, but if you go back to, you know, the witch burning times, as we would call them, um, where they said, oh, well, magic was the devil, you know, to do magic was the devil. But really, if you thought about it, old ladies <laughs> or older ladies, but even men too, um, medicine men, as they would call them, um, were still hypocrisy. Uh, I can't talk today. You can talk better than me. Apothecaries. Um, mm -hmm. So they were the medicine people of their time. They were doctors, nurses, uh, people we have today. Um, so could you kind of elaborate on that? Because that seemed like a very fascinating um, subject. So, mm -hmm. so um, the way I structured the this next book, the language of languages of magic, is um, I, I spent quite a bit of time talking about the history and core ideas within linguistics and semiotics, but I also talk about the history of theories of magic because I want to put it in context, what's different about this approach with semiotics and signs. Um, and if you look back through the, through the history of magic, uh, magic as an area of study, uh, as an area of academic study, starts to become a thing in the 19th century. The reason it becomes a thing in the 19th century, um, it has to do with colonialism, uh, where you have at the height of the colonial era, especially, uh, era, especially within uh, the British Empire and uh, with, uh, with France, um, you you have this the sense of trying to understand why do these people in the colonies that we've stolen um, have these have these ideas that are so different from ours and all, with a with a healthy mix of how do we get them to have our ideas too um, and frankly because it's colonialism it's also how can we use this to exploit them a little bit better so it's not a great history but it it, it is it's the history that happened whether whether we like it or not. Um, and um, the first person that really starts to look at magic as a phenomenon is a, it was actually the first professor of anthropology at Cambridge. Um, there was a name named um, E.B. Tyler. Um, and he had this idea that um, you had, um, you had so-called primitive people that don't understand science, that don't understand religion. All they have is this crazy magic stuff. Um, and he, he was actually the person that coined the term pseudoscience specifically to define what magic was and the way that he was looking at it. Um, so 
he because of his position and his his fame for for other reasons in anthropology you know he kind of made this his kind of soapbox issue to to talk about see we need to teach you know all, all these non-english people the way so they become proper english people like like the rest of us um doing science and industry and all these sorts of things um and he was very confused because he was approaching this from the point of view of magic is obviously bull bull crap so why do these people believe this stupid stuff um so it's not a very scientific attitude, frankly. Um, but he was like, "Science is the way. Anthropology is a new science. We're going to we're going to use science to look at these things and hopefully um, come to understand through science um, why these people can't understand science." Um, someone who was a sort of um, indirect protege of his, named James Fraser, who, who was pretty well known, uh, wrote a, a I think also like a thirteen volume um, uh, book or work called The Golden Bow, a very influential book in the early 20th century um, in a wide variety of fields, um, and was very influenced by Darwin's ideas about evolution as well. And um, uh, Fraser had this idea that he kind of took from Tyler and um, developed a bit about this evolutionary model of how societies go, that they start off um, believing in primitive magic, and then they evolve into um, more conventional religion by which he meant Christianity. Um, and then they evolve into science and then now they can discard magic. They can discard, um, they can discard religion because all they have is science. Um, and this has proven to be a very intractable idea. Um, in fact, if you speak with many people today that they will say, well, science means you don't need magic in, anymore. Um, because, because people have this idea that, um, that science has somehow replaced other, other forms of knowledge. This is a position that's called scientism, um, and science is, is wonderful. Uh, scientism, not so much. And what scientism is specifically, and the reason why it's not a good thing, is it essentially elevates science to the level of a religion in terms of you have the one true faith, meaning the correct scientific approach to this problem. You have, um, you don't have uh, you know, vagaries of meaning anymore. You, you have science to explain what things mean. You don't have um, a cause of phenomenon any, uh, phenomena anymore. You have science to explain how the, the physics of how everything causes everything else to happen. Um, it, it's basically taking it too far and um, taking it too far out of its original context. Science is fantastic and is the best tool we have for understanding how something works. Um, science is a very poor tool for understanding why something works or what it means. Total uh, astronomy freak. I love astronomy um, because the physics of like a black hole, for example, completely out the window. I mean, they, they don't follow any of the physics we have here on Earth. And obviously, I mean, it's out in the cosmos. So, um, yeah, and, and I uh, it blows my mind that so much of science came from these people who were trying to prove the existence of their religion and found something else instead so um well but, but a lot of that a lot of that comes from especially um from the the middle ages on when we start to have the rise of science as we know it is because the uh the church was was the place the only place you could go to get an education um and so there was um there was this kind of mixed purposes that they were trying to wrestle with. And sometimes they came down on the right, the right balance on it. Sometimes they didn't. But but even with with magic, one one thing that's often missed and overlooked with magic by people looking for just a quick fix um, um, is that magic nearly always must be followed up with action in the real world. Uh, magic is one part of making something happen. It's not by itself the only thing. Um, and so when you when you engage in magic, it's it's necessary to to investigate what other things you need to do. Like for, to take like a very kind of sort of mundane example, if you're trying to get a job, you would never just do a ritual hoping your job falls in your lap. You would then you might do a ritual to uh, to realign what you're looking for, to clarify what you need, um, to even maybe to to orient your will towards acquiring certain kinds of jobs. But then you go apply for them. You go update your resume. You do interviews. Um, you know, if you just do magic for, for something, you are not necessarily setting yourself up for success. It's going to vary what you're trying to bring about, of course, but, but in many things, um, you know, you, 
why would you not throw everything you can at, at a problem? And so magic becomes one of those tools. And, that, and that's where magic and science can work together on, on something that, that needs to happen is to work with both sides of it, um, you know, attack it from the, the, the physical cause and effect um, perspective, at the same time, tackle it from the conceptual perspective of what needs to be, what needs to be different in your mindset, what needs to be different in the, the attitudes of the people around you in order to make this thing happen. Um, absolutely, and, absolutely. Can you talk, like, maybe, um, uh, I, I know that you, um, like, manifestation, like, how do we get that wrong? Do you know, like, why some people can manifest stuff and other people can't? Um, I know that's like a big topic among everybody today is, you know, why can't I man manifest, you know, a uh, million dollars, let's say, um, mm -hmm. or why can't I manifest me being wealthy and having three houses and stuff? Can you talk a little bit about that? Cause it seemed like you were like kind of reaching to that or going mm -hmm. towards that because I know something manifestation can be uh, kind of like a two edged sword. You know what I mean? Like you manifest something, but then you you don't manifest something else. For me, it was uh, getting three shows. <laughs> I have three podcasts that I do. Mm -hmm. and, and that's cool. I like that. I like doing podcasts. Um, but can you talk a little bit about like maybe why some people can manifest things easier than others maybe? Uh, so, yeah. So there, I'm going to hit this from a couple of different angles. One, I'm um, a couple of comments on... Um, you know, the balance factor, um, in a sense. And, th and then I'm going to borrow a couple of ideas from, from Don Webb, um, because I think he, he basically solved, solved that issue. So I'm going to, uh, you know, share my impression of what I think his, his correct solution is to some of that. So, um, effective magic requires that you have a sense of what is and is not within your realm of possibility. Um, you you have to um, you have to find out where things are almost but not quite settled into place so that there's still some room to affect things, but by the same token, you're you still have a foundation to work within. And so what, what this kind of means is that if you're if you're looking, um, you know, for something big, you have to examine is there something that's more that's more immediately attainable that you you can acquire first that you can create first that creates this foundation you're going to stand on to reach the next thing. Um, you have to, if you think of magic as this ever sort of, you're building up a foundation of your own self work and your, and your own abilities and your own, your own needs. And then you're using that not just to maintain what you already have, but to use as a jumping off point for things that are beyond that. You know, think of it in, in sort of steps. You know, in, instead of just, hey, I need a million dollars. Well, well, may, maybe I need something smaller first, and that that puts me in position to, um, you know, to start this company, which then will bring this, um, you know, which then I'll um, use to, you know, to learn how to market effectively, and and then build on things to, to, to make it there. Um, I mean, you should always reach kind of just outside what you're what you think you're capable of. You know, just like if you're an athlete trying to you know, to better your, your time in a race, for example, you know, you always push yourself to go a little bit beyond what you think you're capable of, because that's how you grow. Um, and the other thing is uh, people will often um, aim for the stars, so to speak, with magic without having a good base to stand on. If you're, if someone is struggling to, to hold down a job or struggling to move out of their parents' basement, and then, but at the same time, they're aspiring to become, a you know, you know, a millionaire to keep using that example. It's like, maybe there's other stuff you should be working on first, you know, start with, start with what is within, within your, your grasp and start with what will build foundations for even bigger and better things. instead of just going straight for the bigger and better thing. Um, you know, the same things that we learn about how to plan effectively, um, you know, apply to magic as well, you know, get to this level with something before you try to, to go to this next bigger level. Um, the idea I want to, the pair of ideas I actually want to bring in from, from Don Webb. Um, he has a wonderful book, his latest book on inner traditions, which is called how to become a modern Magus, um, which was not his original choice for the title. Um, he wanted, um, uh, a year of living magically, which I think is, is a wonderful uh, approach. Although 
I don't know if the Modern Magnus has a certain zing to it. I'll, I'll grant it. Um, but this is a very difficult book in some ways, not because it's hard to read. It's actually his style is very um, easy to read. Um, and I aspire to be one tenth the writer that he is. Um, but what's difficult is that he, he tells you some things that people don't often hear when they go down the path of warning magic, which is you will fail the very vast majority of the time. This is difficult. Anything that tell any book that tells you this is easy, all you have to do is, is say this is lying to you and just trying to sell you a book. Um, although it should be noted, they're not making a million dollars either. So there, there's there's no there's no money in writing um, books of this type. Um, there's there's just the enduring fame of of seeing your your books on on the shelves at, at big bookstores. Um, but one of the things he repeats is sort of a mantra throughout the book. And this is something that he's had for years. It's not new with the book is that the secret of magic is to transform the magician. And what that means is, is that if you're not first and foremost doing work on yourself to turn yourself into the kind of person that can do that more aspirational work, then you're missing an important step. Now for the, you know, the cases like you, you describe of people that magic just seems to come to them naturally. There are natural music, magicians or people that it just seems to kind of come to that even maybe that they don't quite understand what they're doing. Um, and I, I think that if you talk with such people and sort of um, try to get into what exactly is going through your head when you, when you, when you do this and why is this just perfectly naturally to you is probably because they have already acquired through magical means or not, that effective base from which to operate so that instead of having to focus any of their magical energy, even if they don't think of it in those terms, on that sort of base maintenance of become a, a you know, a, a stable, potent, powerful essence that can make things happen within the world, um, they've done it through other means. Um, and so that that being distracted by your, your shooting for the stars, but really what you really should be concentrating on is maybe you should, you know, move out of you know, your mom's basement. Um, that's a, it, it affects what is within your, your power to, to work with magic. Um, and, and so that it requires a sort of self-awareness that you have to, you have to know kind of what is there, what's, what's waiting for. And, and I, don't, I will say that the, you know, the stereotypical, um, you know, the magician in, in, in the parents' basement um, is, an, is an unfortunate, you know, fa uh, facet of today's world that, that that's not as easy as it used to be. I mean, I, I definitely appreciate that. So I don't want anyone to think I'm being, being sensitive. That's just sort of an old, old school example from, uh, you know, people in my generation when I was in my 20s, I was like, really? You know, maybe you should focus on on that part first and then worry about the. The, the fancy, fancy parts later. Um, and unfortunately, our economy is, you know, where we're going from literally um, <laughs> people like us, of course, will be the the ones who will own nothing, be happy and eat sea bugs. Right. So, um, yeah, I totally get that. Um, I'm yeah. going to turn it over to uh, Matt right now because I have to kind of keep quiet. My son is uh, finally asleep. So uh, go ahead and take it from here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, something else that Don Webb said, I think something like um, instead of needing $50 a month and doing magic for that, transform yourself into someone that doesn't need $50 a month, uh, mm -hmm. which hit home for me. Uh, but yeah, it's a wonderful book he wrote. Um, I was curious how you got into the mathematics of uh, infernal geometry in that play. So um, I, I thought I was good at math until I went to Georgia Tech. Um, turns out, looking back on it now, uh, you know, my my favorite math class was always geometry. Uh, you know, I was fascinated by proportions and and how. Um, you know the different shapes interact, um, and, and and how how you can break down um, new things within within the world into geometric shapes, and how those shapes interact with with each other. Um, so it was always sort of like a background, kind of interesting kind of idea. And as I began to learn about more sort of um, symbolic types of magic, it it sort of uh, began to call to me. Um, when I when I first joined the the, the temple, the first 
um, uh, sort of regional gathering that I went to, which was, I think, maybe four months or so into the time I was uh, a member of the temple. It was the first time I met other Setians in person, um, et cetera. And as, as it happens, I was the only first degree, the only sort of um, kind of entry level uh, member that was there. So I was sort of the object of curiosity because everyone else already knew each other. And they were like, oh, let's find out what this guy's all about. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of talking with, with a senior member who was there. Um, and, uh, he had, um, and I had mentioned a bit as I, it's like, you know, I hear there, there's something new with mathematics and magic, and I'm maybe kind of interested in that as well. And he, um, he asked someone else to come over and said, Hey, this, this guy has his interest. You talk to him about this thing called the nine angles, uh, which looking back now, that's maybe not the, the best thing to just dump in a, in a uh, brand new study in his lap. Um, but we didn't have a book about it back then. So maybe now it's an easier thing to just, um, Throw, throw to someone. Um, and so I started looking at this. So what the nine angles are. Um, um, because it, it was always something that, that came into being within the within the temple of Set. Well, um, within the Church of Satan and then later in the temple of Set. Um, people get the wrong idea sometimes. And sometimes they don't even want to read the book because they see magical system with the nine angles and think it's about something that it's not. Um, but so, so but the symbol. So um, what this is, this is, a, in effect, a particular geometric map of the psyche and the way it relates to the, um, to the universe outside of itself. Um, and, you know, this, this is the, the, the topic of, of the book that I was just um, showing you. I know you know it, <laughs> the map, but your listeners may not. Um, and so here's what this is. In... Uh, 1971, Anton LaVey was writing the follow-up to the Satanic Bible. It was a book that came to be called The Satanic Rituals. And because he was running short on time, because Anton was not a great writer um, and was not a very um, honest writer, he would lift other material regularly and give it his own spin, uh, to, to be fair. Um, he had asked uh, Michael Aquino um, later to found the Temple of Set. At that time, sort of his uh, left-hand man, if you will, in the Church of Satan, um, to contribute a couple of uh, Lovecraft, contribute a Lovecraft ritual to the book. Um, and so Aquino goes off and he writes uh, what was called the Ceremony of the Nine Angles, um, which took a look at Pythagorean number mysticism, the, the works of H.P. Lovecraft, and um, the hints of language with um, the language of the old ones in H.P. Lovecraft and sort of brought these ideas in, into this this ritual that, that kind of it didn't really try to develop a magical system in, in of itself. It was really meant originally to be a standalone ritual, um, but it um, did have the seeds of some ideas that were later taken up by Stephen Flowers and others to to see the implications of them. And the Pythagorean part is the important part. Pythagoras uh, you know, was a very multi uh, multi talented um, you know philosopher and mathematician in, in ancient Greece, of course. Um, and one of the things that was a characteristic of the the school that Pythagoras created and um, sort of ran was the um, uh, what we call number mysticism, uh, effectively the idea that oneness and twoness and threeness and so forth, all the way up to Tenness have these intrinsic properties. If you think about in terms of basic geometry, you have a point which has no dimension. It's just a single um, locus in space. Um, you know, it's it's unified in and of itself. Um, there's no direction to go. There, there's no depth to it, et cetera. It, it's singular in and of itself. Um, and then as you stress that out into a line, if you have two points and then you connect the two points, you have a line. Well, the line, you know, have two directions. You can go that way or you can go that way or whichever the, the line, way the line's up oriented. Now you have a choice, go to one versus the other. You you stress that into, you add a third point. They're all lines between between those. Now you have a triangle. Now you have perspective. Now you can, now you're not just seeing the line from within itself. If you're sort of imagining yourself moving along the line, you, you now can look outside the original line and see it from a new perspective. Um, and, and so forth. So this was very math, uh, geometric thing that he was looking at, but it was also um, this idea that you have, you know, the monad and the dyad and the triad and so forth that have these properties 
that explains something about the way the universe uh, becomes into being. This is part of their cosmology. This is how they were trying to explain how the universe began from uh, nothing to become what it is today as these um, as the number that they saw was underlying all uh, creation begins to interact with itself to build upon itself and to expand it into bigger and bigger things and so everything could be expressed in terms of of mathematics in, in some way um, so this idea that um that there's a there's something magical or, or, or not magical in their uh, point of view really but more kind of uh mystical and deep about the individual numbers as they develop it was a very core idea of uh, the Pythagorean um, outlook. And you see it pop up in Plato um, in several of his dialogues where he talks about um, the mathematics of the cosmos and um, the golden ratio and things like this. So fast forward 2,500 years later, and you have Aquino writing the Ceremony of the Nine Angles, and he's trying to, to put this into a framework to, to work with what he saw as um, the four sort of core Lovecraft deities of um, Azathoth, uh, Yaxothoth, Nairohotep, and Shiv Nigarath. Um, Notice that Cthulhu, Cthulhu is not in there. Cthulhu gets all the press, but Cthulhu is actually a minor side character in most of Lovecraft. He has one story, and then he's um, that's a fantastic story about Cthulhu, and then he's just kind of mentioned a couple of others. Um, some of the, these others pop up again and again and again. They're very they're much more core features of Lovecraft's cosmology. I'm pretty sure Lovecraft will be very surprised to find Cthulhu is the one you guys get hooked on. All right, um, but um, and. And so Aquino has an, has this idea. He realizes, wait a minute, Azathoth is the crawling chaos. It's basically the, the center of, of the cosmos from which everything else emanates. That kind of sounds like the monad. Then Yaxothoth is where, um, as the monad expands, now order starts to spontaneously arise within it. Wait, that starts to sound like the dyad. Um, and, and, and so forth. Um, and he starts to kind of realize the, these kind of first form map onto this thing. Now that figure, um, again, if you pull off the, the circle, that was a later um, addition to his meaning. That figure of a trapezoid and a pentagram, that was actually something that was created by, by LeVay. He used it as part of the Church of Satan letterhead. He didn't have a name for it, he just thought it was cool. It was part of his idea about, about this order of the trapezoid, um, um, which was sort of the, this kind of behind the scenes thing that he was trying to cultivate. It never really had a former structure within the within the Church of Satan. Um, it was later developed into something very formal within the Temple of Set. Um, and in fact, um, I, I'm, I'm currently the head of that within within the temple, um, sort of reflecting of that that knowledge and understanding of, of these ideas and, and other things. But um, and what Aquino had was this idea that if you have the the trying uh, the sorry the trapezoid that's there, that you could think about the first um, the those four angles of the trapezoid as sort of mapping onto the um, those four Lovecrafting deities. And so we had this idea that the trapezoid is the way we see the universe, the way we, we understand the objective universe. So it's not the universe itself, it's our perspective on it, it's the, our understanding of it. And that the, the, the pentagram within that, um, you know, very, you know, well-known symbol connected with, with Satanism and, and, um, settingism and, and and other things things as well. Um, Aquino had this idea that that that, um, that is the core representative of the psyche. That's that's the the interior, our understanding of ourselves. Um, and then this idea that the two connect at the top. Um, we have the the top two points of the pentagram connecting with um, the top two points of the trapezoid. Is that idea that they connect here, and this is this is how um the psyche comes to comprehend the objective universe um because of that connection that, that they both share um and so that sort of insight there and combining it with adding the lovecraftian language and, you know and you know all, all that they sort of just hinted at a lovecraft he develops it out uh coins a bunch of new words with it using the same sort of patterns etc to make it into this very powerful and very very strange um ritual um and so that later becomes this kind of um this kind of shibboleth if you will for for looking at mathematics through a magical lens um going back very deep ideas on the western tradition going back to pythagoras um, you know the ideas of pythagoras have um in plato especially have had 
you know, just unspeakably broad influence are on so much that's come after them. Um, mathematics, science, philosophy, um, cosmology, et cetera. They're very deeply embedded in, in Western ideas um, in a ways that sometimes are not even appreciated. But, oh, that's where that, that's what it sort of came from. And even there, there's always arguments about how much of that Pythagoras really originated versus he learned elsewhere. Whether or not he went to Egypt, that's kind of up for debate. He probably um, inherited some things from um, the Zoroastrians, um, uh, which would have been not that, you know, just a, a few hundred years before that, which is which was very influential in, in Mediterranean thought um, at that period of time, um, et cetera. Um, but anyway, the, these are very pervasive and very old ideas um, that connect these things in a very deep way. And so, you know, I look at them from a magical perspective. Um, and see those connections, but I can also look from a philosophical perspective, um, um, and from the that kind of that blending of um, that sort of more linguistic background with that kind of scientific background as well. Interesting that you say connect the dots in a mathematical sense, but um, as a turn of phrase, it's very uh, linguistically connected. Um, I'm really interested in sayings that like survived the test of time. Um, what do you think of those or why do they stick around uh, the way they do do you think well in the terms of, of plato especially uh, it was because his work survived we have we have a great number of documents from him compared to uh, you know other philosophers uh, that predated him we have a, we have a few things and in fact we have lots of commentary on on some of them uh, more than original works from some of the pre-socratic philosophers um i mean it's uncertain how much was written down right because a lot of this would have been a oral tradition um, but, um, but certainly a lot was, and, and in fact, um, you know, a lot of Plato's ideas survived through Aristotle, um, who was his student in, in turn. Um, a lot of Plato's work was, was actually lost in the, um, uh, in Europe basically for, for, you know, a thousand years or so during the, during the dark ages and actually comes back into Europe by way of, um, scholars fleeing uh, the fall of Constantinople in the late 15th century. This was around the same time, excuse me, the, around the same time that the Renaissance is, is peaking up in Italy. So you have basically people with the funds and the interests are like, hey, come on over here. I hear you got you guys got books, bring them. Well, I'll, I'll give you a job over here. Um, and you'll, you'll be safe, we'll protect you. We, we, have, we have armies and stuff. Um, and, and so there's always, there's always a survivorship bias. Uh, with with ideas like that, um, you know, uh, and it depends on which things get written about more and more because the more things, not only copies of the works but also other people writing about those ideas, the more you have of that, the more things will survive. You you even see this in a much much later point of view. Um, you know, uh, the the entire corpus of old English literature that we have, you know, things actually written in the old English period when that was the form of English that was spoken. It, it, the sum total of that is something like three million words total. If you add up like every word we 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 have in every document, just do a word count in every document that exists, add up right, three million. The collected works of Charles Dickens were four and a half million words. Kind of put that in perspective. And um, and so there's so much that's been lost for a variety of reasons. Um, people reusing the parchment for other things, um, books that you know get burned or get reused. Oh, we we have a better version. We don't need that anymore. Um, you like there were massive numbers of works that were lost um, in the the dissolution of the monasteries by Henry VIII when he was in the process of breaking with the Catholic Church. He basically gave everybody free license. Hey, here we don't need the monasteries anymore. Go go raid them. Take what you want. And so lots of stuff gets destroyed. Um, um, but but the, what I, the point I was gonna make about survivorship there is you know because we have like you know we we have limited number of things that, that survive. I mean, and, and very often only one copy survives. Um, but to put it in perspective, there was a there was a work of popular history by Geoffrey of Monmouth uh, from around the year 800 um, called the the History of the Kings of Britain, um, which was such a popular book on both um, Britain and the continent, like 200 copies of it still survive. So again, survivorship bias. It's like some things if it if it catches the right you know, the wind and, you know, gets spread around enough and people write about it, they talk about it, they, it becomes like, or it becomes like the thing you've got to have on your bookshelf, um, you know, then that, the thing survive. You, you, you think about now, it's like sometimes, like, I'm sure we've all had the experience of like, you know, finding out a book that's like, oh, that's, a, I need to read this book. 
Um, and then find, oh, it's out of print. And then you have to go hunt around finding copies and oh, they cost, cost money and all this kind of stuff. So there, there, there's always a big survivorship bias towards those ideas. Um, same thing with things like, um, like runic inscriptions. You know, there's a limited number of them that survive from especially the Elder Futhark period from the early dec early centuries of the, the common era because they were mostly written on perishable materials. They were written on wood. They were written on bone. They, they, don't, they don't survive. Um, so, yeah, so th that's always something you have to take into account. Um, but that being said, I mean, the thing that influences people making co more copies of a book or, or a work, people making um, references to it in other works, it does have to do with the quality of the ideas. It has to do this this touched accord, this something about it makes it was like, oh, that's interesting. We want to we want to keep that idea around. Um, and yeah, it, it's a very I mean, there's an entire study devoted to this called philology, um, where um, where it's basically you you look at documents, you look at how how documents survive and how ideas um, develop through documents um, and and there's a lot of historical kind of look into um, you know where do certain ideas come from that's part of philology um and even some people like um like nietzsche uh, was i mean we think of nietzsche as a philosopher but his primary vocation was originally as a philologist philologist um and then he he just starts to become more and more philosophical about the way he's approaching it um so so yeah so it, it's it's a it's a mix and it's always you, you always have to wonder like was there an even better idea that didn't make it you know, because like sometimes it's like so now, so now it's a new idea again. Um, yeah, that, that's why I'm always skeptical about things that claim to be completely brand new ideas never thought before in the history of the world, because it's like eh, that's a, that's a hard claim to make. It may, may be true, um, but but it is a hard claim to make uh, just because there's there's so much that's been lost either because it was only ever oral or because, you know, documents don't last forever. Not even electronic ones. That's something that's going to be a you know bigger problem as as we go along. You have you have problems with like we can't read all the original you know source code from um, you know the computers involved with the moon landing uh, because the either the 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 medium that they're stored on uh, has, has decayed or because the the code for how to decode this particular byte sequence is gone, um, et cetera. You know, media de media decays. Um, I mean, there, are, you know, there are, there are ways to make durable media that will last a long time, but they're, they're not. It doesn't scale up. So you could now it's like everything we have, we should put it on this instead, so that we don't we don't lose it. And even then, if you if you have, you know, if you have a record and you don't know what to do with it, how would you never ever figure out that this had music on it at one point? Yeah, we've lost a lot of film like that too, unfortunately. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, we're coming up to towards the end, but um, where can people find you? Uh, we'll have the links in the description as well. Right, sure. um, so the, the current place I'm sort of there's I'm kind of hanging out as my, my base of operations. I, I'm because I'm less than a year from the this next book coming out. And I'm kind of starting to gear up some of the 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 PR part of it, which I I generally love. I'll, podcasts i like doing because they're fun i like talking to people about these ideas but the you know the putting stuff out on social media and all that kind of stuff it's like it's it's tedious but it has to be done um but anyway uh what i, I have a, a website that's my my new and current blog which is kind of my my kind of base operations called semiurgist.com um i'll send that to you to make sure you you have it in there um uh, the correct spelling and all that um and that has that has links that will also show um provide an email contact and the links to twitter and we'll see twitter blue sky and facebook are the ones that i have at the moment um that, that i'll be kind of pushing things out through um sharing random things but also sharing stuff from the blog as a way to kind of reach people and to um, um have a way to kind of talk about the ideas with people uh, but I, I welcome email contact. There's an email address on, on that on that website. Feel free to write to me for anybody that's interested. Uh, feel free to follow me to any of those other resources to just kind of keep abreast of kind of what's going on. Well, it's funny that you mention um, because this is my four terabyte hard drive mm -hmm. that has not only all three of my shows, but has pictures of my son when he was uh, in my tummy. 
So my whole life is on this drive. Now, that being said, I have two other ones that also have everything that has this on it. So, um, so when you say about redundancy and backup, I definitely agree that, um, you know, I've had things crash on me and like any good computer, you know, you're going to have a hard drive that crashes. And I like to tell my customers, you know, um, back up, back up, back up, back up. You should always have backup and redundancy on everything. And some customers, unfortunately, don't understand that. So they can't understand like why we can't get their information off of a bad hard drive or a hard drive that has literally gone um, or, or crashed for good. <laughs> Um, so I, I completely understand. And like I said, that's when you were saying, you know, uh, nothing is forever unless, you know, you have backups of backups. And then <laughs> if one dies, well, at least you, you have another drive to take over. Hopefully those don't, the, those don't die as well. So, um, well, that's, it's it's just... <clears throat> Go ahead. we don't have the problem the way they had with, you know, these older documents we were talking about. Mm -hmm. If you think about 200 plus copies of Jeffrey and Mom with Mom with this work, someone wrote every single one of those out by hand. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you don't have to to write out four terabytes and then make sketches of all the pictures and all that to have to have copies. Well, this of, is four terabytes. <laughs> <laughs> My whole life is on the thing. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's, there's at least at least that small blessing from technology. A small blessing, but I wouldn't say it's a complete blessing yep. because eventually some days uh, or some day uh, these will be obsoleted and then we'll have a different kind of technology, kind of like those little thumb drives you see, which I do have thumb drives too. Um, <clears throat> they will probably take over for these bulky, even though this is like a travel one, I can just plug this into my computer anywhere and mm. literally just get all the stuff off of it. But, I mean, we'll have even smaller hard drives because, actually, I do have a smaller hard drive. <sighs> and it's an SSD, too. So, they'll be, like, as small as this or even smaller. This yeah. is my 4 terabyte SSD. Which... I, uh, uh, I have so many family tapes on beta. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, technology is ever growing and ever taking over. Um, you know, several years ago, I, I had a guy come to me the hard drive was at least one gig. The hard drive was one gig. And and we was really, really old. I don't even know how he was getting it, you know, getting it to boot up or anything. But it finally, <laughs> after like, I don't know, it was like 30, 40 years, like the, finally this hard drive crashed and it was one gig. And I couldn't get it to boot up no matter what I did. <laughs> it just finally crashed after 40, 50 years. Um, so I think some things last and some things don't. <laughs> um, hopefully for us that we, at, you and I are in the computer field, um, you work with servers and I work with actual laptops and desktops, uh, tearing them apart and putting them back together, make sure they work for our customers. Um, it, it's, I always like to say this, everyone's like, oh, well, get this uh, VPN and you'll be okay. Yeah, you won't be okay from the NSA. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, nothing is ever secure. And if anyone ever tells you anything is secure, they're full of yeah. crap. Yeah, there's always anything there's can be hacked way, into. Yeah, yeah, there's always a round, way around it if someone has a reason to. <laughs> um, well, uh, we've come to the end of our uh, interview. I'd like to thank you, Toby, for sharing this hour with us. And we definitely have to have you back on because. Um, I'd like to know what, what's going on in the server world uh, mm -hmm. now that I'm no longer a help desk jockey. Um, <laughs> I used to be. I used to be only help desk, and now I'm more desktop support where I'm, you know, tearing them apart, putting them back together, like mm -hmm. I said, for my customers. Um, <coughs> so, um, Yeah, mm -hmm. it feels like we only kind of scratch the servers on some of, some of these things we talked about. There's, there's so many other directions we could go. Oh um, my gosh! I'd yes. be happy to do another one if, if you want to do a follow up. I, I and know. we could probably spend three hours on just the one subject alone. Trust me, mm -hmm. been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday well, I had um, a show and it was almost two hours. So we we spent almost two hours talking about wrestling, you know, that kind <laughs> of thing. That that's my other two uh, 
channels is uh, Pro Wrestling Talk. And then uh, we also have uh, Kurt Henning was the best, changed my mind. And this is Kurt. <laughs> I don't know if you know anything about professional wrestling, Toby, but. Um, uh, ask me about uh, wrestling from the 80s. And yeah, but. Uh, okay. So <laughs> Did you like any certain territory? Uh, well, I, I mean, Atlanta was a major territory back then. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they were. There were a lot of, um, you know, we started having the big kind of the, the mega, you know, territory started to happen. You know, a lot of those guys were originally from Atlanta, mm -hmm. the Memphis crowd. There was a lot of kind of crossover with those. Those are kind of the big, mm -hmm. those are kind of the two of the big ones in the South. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, yeah. Georgia and Memphis. And then they kind of converged and became WCW with the NWA. Um, and then a lot of guys were either WWF or NWA or WCW, which it would eventually become. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, once Vince started eating up all the territories, it kind of, right. it just it either fell, you were like NWA, WCW, or you were WWF, you know. Uh, my guy was in Portland and AWA. But he also did venture around. He was in Memphis. He was in Florida. He was in Puerto Rico for a while. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, he would eventually go to all of the territories except for California. And I don't think he – there's uh, – he didn't go to Stampede, um, which was Calgary. But he actually went to, like, certain parts of Canada. But just not the, the Stampede and Stu Hart and Bret Hart. <laughs> That's yeah. where they all kind of congregated. Well, because um, there was a big, there was a big uh, wrestling school in Atlanta. Um, mm -hmm. that, the training mm -hmm. ground for a lot of them, not, not just people that were, I mean, they would, sometimes they would pick guys out of it as like, oh, like you're staying here. But sometimes mm -hmm. they would like training ground to go to other places as well. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, yes. they had indie circuits as well. Eventually, yes, when WWF took over and WCW, um, they also had little indie circuits that were kind of like territories that refused to take the passing of the territories. But yeah, the, the 80s, yeah. if you go to the rock and wrestling, which was WWF, when they would try that rock, rock and wrestling in 84 and talking 84, 85, oh. <coughs> um, there was also a big one in uh, it was Minnesota. Uh, Wisconsin and, and the Midwestern states, and that was called the AWA, and that's where he prospered. <laughs> yeah. Till he went to the WWF, of course. So, I mean, you're welcome on my other show if you'd like to talk about wrestling. Uh, and, uh, not, I don't remember <laughs> enough of the the details about this. Part. I, my 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 dad watched it a lot, and you know, you, you even occasionally would would like see it like at the old Atlantic Civic Center. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a long time since I followed it mainly because like, I, I, I like that sort of small kind of feel to it, but, um, yeah, well, oddly enough, one of my major semiotics influences, uh, the French, uh, semiotician Roland Bart, um, had a, he had this wonderful collection, uh, back in the fifties called mythologies. And he had this idea that, um, would you, if you analyze, um, <clears throat> how semiotics can help you to understand things like advertising or pro wrestling mm -hmm. is the reason why I'm mentioning this. Um, you know, and a wide variety of things you can look at, popular cultural things you look mm -hmm. at that, um, you look at what, what are the signs in play here that are trying to convey a certain mythology around them? And then more importantly, what is, what, what become, what is that a carrier for this, the real message? For example, you know, take like a, you know, pretty, we're, we're kind of used to being skeptical of advertising at this point. So it's actually an easy mm -hmm. one to kind of, to kind of talk about. Um, you know, he wrote about, there was, um, there were some popular soap commercials, um, like for soap for like doing your laundry at home and, and whatever there were, um, there were popular in, in France at the time, uh, but on television and also, and also other media. And he, and he wrote about, okay, well, this is what's, this is what's happening. This is sort of like the, the image are trying to portray here. Um, of the, what this soap is good for and why you should use this soap versus the other soap. But if you look at, um, but if you, if you peel it back and look a layer below that, uh, what you find is that it's sort of smuggling in these other ideas. So in these other ideas about, you know, the proper place of, you know, a woman in the home, the proper place, uh, the proper ideas about what, what, how should you approach cleanliness in order to be considered, you know, a, 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 
properly integrated member of society and things like this. So this is the idea that there, there's multiple layers to that and that it's easy to become seduced by one layer and be, become blind to the other layers. And so you have to kind of, you have to kind of start from the, the most obvious, the, the thing that grabs your attention the most and begin to peel that back. And you look at that with pro wrestling as well. Um, this would have been, you know, French, the French version of pro wrestling, you know, which, you know, would have had some of the same tropes as American wrestling, but some not because they, they were interested in American culture too, obviously. Um, but you um, would look at that in terms of, well, what is, what is this conveying? Okay. This is you know, like the storylines and, you know, the, the kayfabe around what they're doing. Although, although I don't think kayfabe was a term in use of the, in the fifties, but the same idea. Um, like what was, you know, what is this, you know, what's the, the story that they're telling, but what's the story underneath that they're also sort of smuggling in that you're just sort of accepting along with the other story around like, uh, around like the, the nature of, of combat and war, of, of the nature of manliness, the, the nature of, um, you know, the, the things that they do that are, that are plausible, but you deep down inside, you know, that's not really true. You know, like what, what things are kind of coming along for the ride with these ideas. And so that's a very important thing to think about is, you know, semiotics is a tool for magic, for creating change within the world, but it's also just as a potent of a tool for understanding what crude magic the world is trying to work on you. And, and what things are working beneath the surface that you should learn how to see and learn how to not be seduced just by the outer layers of. Um, so see, brought it all together. And now, now you just need one podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, only if that were true. Yeah. But um, I do want to do some shameless plugs real quick, if you don't mind, Matt. Okay. So um, on my other, Kurt Hedding was the best change in my mind. Um, we have episode 47 just uh, dropped on Rumble and also on YouTube. If you would like to watch along with me, because I actually show videos in there, uh, we do four promos and then we watch along to Kurt's match. Um, you are more than welcome to, to my Rumble. It's down in the description field. Um, I have about 32 followers right now. I'm looking for more. But um, if you enjoy res wrestling as much as I did, um, and of course this guy as much as we all did, um, then uh, just go ahead and click the link in the description field. Um, if you would rather just hear the audio, you can hop on over to YouTube. Again, Kurt Hennig was the best change my mind. And um, episode 48 is coming next week. Um, we're going to do four more promos, and then, of course, we're going to watch along to his match. I believe it's with uh, Diamond Dallas Page on WCW. <laughs> we're kind of doing the WCW stuff, but episode 50 is um, I have uh, my friend Kit Cabello on, and we're actually going to watch along to his matches with all the ECW guys because he was a big ECW guy, um, and I... If, I'm so glad that I, I'm not going to promote this <laughs> because it has a word that I, I didn't even, I've seen this promo a billion times, didn't even realize the guy said the, the word. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and he said it back in 83. It was 83 on TV in Portland Wrestling. This guy said this word. I was like, wow, I've seen this a billion times. Um, anyway... Uh, so if you want to check that out, everything's in the description field. Again, we'll be next week. Uh, Matt, do we have anybody next week? Yep, we've got uh, Daniel coming from the Rune Guild and uh, House of Mages. Awesome. Okay, so next week, catch us here with Daniel. Yes, okay. So Daniel will be with us, and we were going to interview him. Uh, Toby, thank you so much for uh, being with us for this hour. And, uh, of course, there's always pro wrestling talk every Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, unless you hear otherwise, like we have family functions or something. But um, we talk about wrestling, and um, we, uh, we're going to talk about the Bash in Berlin which is coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, my, my host angel is his birthday on the 30th, I believe. And then it's bash in Berlin. So like, it's a play on words, like instead of bash at the beach, it's bash in Berlin. <laughs> so they're actually going to Germany, uh, for wrestling. Um, and there's some interesting matches that we're going to talk about. So uh, catch us this Saturday. We're probably going to review AEW again. I don't know why. <laughs> um, I recorded Raw, so we're going to review that. Um, 
And I, I almost forgot that SmackDown was not Thursday anymore. In the Attitude Era, it was Thursday Night SmackDown. Now it's Friday Night SmackDown. So I have to remember that. Um, so anyway, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed this lovely interview with our lovely guest, Toby. Uh, sorry to bar you, bore you with the details, but um, just some shameless bugs that we do. Uh, if you want to learn more about him, just go ahead and click the link in the description field. Um, and that's it for us, guys. We will see you next week. And blessed be everybody. See ya. All right, thanks.